it's funny, we were talking pre-show, you're from Cincinnati, which I think people don't, people say this is the most northern southern city. Is that the reputation that it has, or was that? Yeah, you know, it's, I, I, I would say so, because, it, you know, people will sometimes say, I have sound like I'm from the south, but, you know, and then, Maybe. then you know, then I, and then, and then the others will say, you know, like east, you know, got a little east coast in me too, so. Yeah. But, um, yeah, it's eastern time zone, and it's, um, it's, it's kind of far up, you know, northwise, but but then it's right next to Kentucky and Louisville yeah. and all that, you know. Yeah. So, you know, yeah. a lot of good whiskey and uh, tobacco farms yeah. right across the river. Yeah, it's kind you of know? funny when you when you drive through Ohio, you just go, "This state is enormous." You know, I'm from yeah. Michigan, but I'm from north of Detroit, so okay. I could leave Michigan in 20 minutes, maybe 45, yeah. depending on traffic. Cincinnati, if you want to go up through to up through to Toledo or something, I mean. Pack a lunch. There's not much, not not, yeah. not much pretty scenery. No. <laughs> when you were a kid, you worked in your dad's restaurant, right? Yeah. 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 Um, so uh, I was uh, 11 years old, and he had uh, he, my father was a restaurateur. He had um, bars, restaurants, um, uh, Irish pubs, you, you name it. It was it was fun. I, I washed dishes. I I joke. You know, how do you become an assistant chef at the age of 11? Um, well, my father owned the restaurant. When the chef didn't show, I was assisting my father in flipping the steaks. You know, so <laughs> so you know, I learned the very early age being an entrepreneur in the restaurant business. You know, had its set of challenges. So um, that was just one of them. People not showing up. Then there was people stealing from me all the time and all that kind of stuff too. But I, I, I had a lot of fun working with my dad for many years. Yeah, I can imagine. I mean, you learned early on that you have to wear every hat in the business as a business owner. My wife's uh, aunt, she owns a Chinese restaurant, and we said, oh, what are the challenges in your business, getting customers? She's like, no, the challenges are I'll hire someone new, they won't show up, and then I'll, or I'll hire someone new uh, or somebody who's been around for a long time, and I'll go, where are the 30 pounds of prime rib that I ordered for the restaurant? And right. they'll look at the security cameras, and four days ago, somebody came into work, stayed 20 minutes later, and hauled off with it, threw it in their car, and brought it home for their, you know, Barbecue. Yeah. So when uh, this is when I worked there was before the security camera days, and my da my dad one time's like, why is the chef taking the garbage out, right? So he followed yeah. him out to the, you know to, with the garbage can, and he lifted up the top bag in there, and there was a, a pile of steaks in the in the garbage can because you know the chef just n never took the garbage out, sure, right? So yeah. little things like that that you got to pay attention to as an entrepreneur, right? Did you take those instincts with you then into business? I mean, how could you not take them? With Absolutely. You? Yeah. I mean it. You know, my father was, you know, we all, you know, I, I grew up a, a Catholic boy from Cincinnati and, you know, altar boy and all that good stuff. So I was sort of trusting until I got into uh, working in my father's businesses because, you know, the chef was stealing steaks, the busboys were stealing knives, the, the bartenders were, were, you know, stealing, you know, cases of liquor. <laughs> and, you know, it was just like, you know, you had to be there, yeah. you know, 24 seven. So um, eventually I just had to take the attitude that, you know, you almost got to just not trust anybody until they prove themselves trustworthy. That's good that you say that because I think most people in general, and you can correct me if you have a different perception, most people you hire are going to be maybe not all-star employees, but are probably going to be more or less trustworthy. Not everybody steals, but that small percentage can cost you so much money that it makes you a little bit jaded after Yeah, I mean, when I when I finally got into the, the I've seen on TV business, one day my auditors came in and they said, hey, what are you selling for $1,000? And I'm like, uh, nothing. We sell $29 yeah, knife ab, sets. ab crunchers. Right, stuff, ab yeah. crunchers, right? So they said, well, last month you issued eight $1,000 credits. And I'm like, really? I said, um, who did they get issued to? Oh, well, you know, this uh, looks like the same person, okay? So yeah. uh, one of my girls in accounting started at $29 it credits but you know w when people return their product somebody had to authorize the the, the credit of their merchant account, sure. of, of their credit card processing right sure. so um, this girl we found out this was it was over $200,000 over a 6 month period wow. but she got more aggressive as she got to month 6 you know with $1000 credits and it was $30 credits and then $100 credits and $500 credits and $1000 credits and you know so she's trying we, to push the uh, limits. yeah and and it was to herself and friends and relatives and and anyway it was just a terrible thing but somebody that was sweet every time i saw her and you know you would never think that you know they were stealing you blind behind your back it sounds like this is well obviously you remembered a lot of these lessons over the years 
do you find it hard to change your perception and, and trust anybody? Because it sounds like you can't not do business because people aren't trustworthy, but you also don't want to treat everybody like they're a criminal because you'd be a terrible, horrible boss to work for if you, if you just assumed everybody was out to rob you. Yeah, I, I think anymore today, what I try to rely on are better systems, uh, better controls, smarter people at the top yeah. that I can trust. And those people, I generally, you know, I have my son working with me and top notch, uh, I call it a SWAT team of, of, <laughs> of help at the top level. These are people that I know well, I can trust them. And then they rely on their instincts to handle the, 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 the people underneath them. So and at the end of the day, I think today, you know, it's, you know, even though I, you know, I still say I like to give people the benefit of the doubt. Um, you know, we, we recently we had somebody that had access to a debit card and was taking a thousand dollars out every day, uh, cash, right? Yeah. Until we found out, right? So, I mean, it's, you, you just, you know, you, you know, and this, so this person reported to somebody in finance and that person in finance just wasn't on top of things the way they right. should. So getting the right control is, I think, one of the key lessons here. It's learned. like trust but verify, I suppose. Exactly. Yeah. Right. <laughs> well, when you first started, you were knocking on doors, meeting a lot of people. What was your first business? I mean, I know you were basically still a kid. Yeah, so, um, so I'm 11 years old, worked in my dad's restaurants for a number of years. And when I turned 15, I said, um, I want to start my own business. I started a driveway ceiling business. And I lived in Ohio, so um, it, would, it would get cold in the winter. So if you had a crack in, in your driveway. Which you, by the way, if you're not from a cold place, you get cracks in your driveway, yeah. new driveway. Every year, there's a new crack. A new crack. You can count on so it. So I would go knock on the doors at 15. I drove around neighborhoods on my bicycle. And I'd take them out. And i say, see that crack? When the water gets in there and it gets cold and it freezes, it's going to be triple the size. Right. They're like, now, I know how ice works. How much money is this <laughs> yeah, going to cost me? Right. So, so you know, the, I was driveway selling driveway ceiling. And I'd yeah. take a picture before and after of a neighbor's driveway. And, and we also beautified the driveway, too. So we sure. sealed it, beautified it. It was a magical trip transformation. I had a picture, I had a neighborhood referral, and we were doing 10 a, a week at the age of 15. So I actually had to buy a truck. I couldn't drive the truck because I wasn't 16 years old, <laughs> yeah. but I hired a guy that was 16 to be able to drive. So, um, you know, that was <laughs> yeah. my first business. But I mean, there there was weeks, you know, we were grossing a thousand bucks a week and, you know, netting probably $700, give or take. So pretty sure. nice because this is now back in the 70s. So um, in today's terms, multiply by three or four or five. And, you know, it's a pretty lucrative little part-time business, you know? Right. Um, and so that was, uh, that was 15 and I, I, and I was in high school, but that was part-time because it was only seasonal in sure. the summertime. And then I said, wow, what can I do year round? And I thought, well, everybody has heating and air conditioning. So I started a air conditioning, heating and air conditioning company. So that was in my year of going, graduating from high school into college. Yeah. And so yeah. that was, that, that, that business became a pretty nice little company then. I definitely want to ask you about that. I, I do want to point out, it sounds like a very familiar formula though, to ride by, see a problem, change the, fix the problem with something simple and quick and then have the magical transformation sounds a lot like what you ended up getting into later. Look at the, look at the before picture and the after picture. Exactly. Before picture in black and white with a little line through it, after picture in color, look how be much better this looks. But looking at the, the HVAC business, this is kind of specialized, right? It, it's not something that most 16 year olds are thinking, oh, I can install ducts, air conditioning units. How did you slide from because driveway resealing you can yeah if you're ambitious nowadays you can learn that on youtube and you can do it yourself so so what happened is i i was sealing the driveways in the summer and i started working for an air conditioning company in sales that was getting a hold of the new homeowner lists in cincinnati and they would outbound telemarket all the new homeowners and tell them that they had some kind of a special deal and send somebody out to the, the, the home to give them um, a quote on either a new furnace or whatever. And so um, right around that time, there was something new called spark ignition furnaces. And up until then, all homes had 
furnaces with pilot lights. Oh, that, yeah. That we burn one of those. 24 hours a day. Right. Very inefficient. And today you won't see pilot lights in very many homes because the, the spark ignition came about in the, in the mid-70s when I decided to start my own company. So I was part-time selling for a company. I became their top salesman. And I'm saying, you know, I'm getting, you know, 8% of, of commission and I'm seeing all the money that they're making. And I'm thinking, hey, I can get that same new homeowner list, call those people and go out and do it myself. So um, after, you know, working for somebody else, I started the heating and air business. And, and it was a pretty fast growth because the, the key thing was having access to those new homeowners. If you just bought a new home, you were credit worthy. You had one of these old furnaces that was inefficient. So right. what we did is we offered them a free furnace cleaning and a safety check. So we pretty much got into about 80% yeah. of, the, of the people that we got a hold of. And then we tell them about this amazing new uh, spark ignition, energy efficient furnace. And of course, almost very few homes in the 70s in Cincinnati had air conditioning, central air. So we would then, oh, you, you just bought a $100,000 house, right. you gotta have some central air. You right. know? You're lighting your money on fire right. already. Why yeah. not add some okay. AC to so, the mix? So, I mean, here again, we built this, this business went from zero to a million dollars in sales. I had 25 employees, six trucks going out every day, and we were just, you know, really taken off. And again, a million in sales back in the 70s, you know, is, is three or four million today. Yeah. So, you know, we had a, a pretty substantial little company. I say, I joke though that, you know, in, in my day as a young entrepreneur, I started driveway sealing and heating and air conditioning. Today, young entrepreneurs start Snapchat yeah. and Facebook. Okay, right. so, so you know. Big Instagram influencer, <laughs> sell an ebook. Yeah, yeah, it's a completely different so, process. It, it's very humbling to, you know, to see what's happening in today's world. Although, to be honest, what you're doing is, is harder in so many different ways and requires a lot of different skills. Not that Instagram or Snapchat doesn't, but the platform's already there. You didn't have a way to sign up for somebody to teach you everything you needed to know about sales, everything you needed to know about HVAC installs. There's there's no YouTube channel to learn how to stay motivated when you feel right. like crap. You're right. I think it was harder back then than it is now. You know, let's put it this way. I was 19 years old running this heating and air conditioning business. And I'll never forget the day I got a phone call from one of my customers. We were installing a furnace and she said, you gotta come out here right now. And I'm, and I'm like, what's the problem? You, I'm not even gonna tell you, get here quickly. And I get there and my installer was asleep, passed out, drunk with a bottle of, of whiskey sitting right next to him oh my God. On the, in, in the basement, right? And so like, I'm, okay, I'm glad I got here before he woke up, right? So, right. You know, but these, you know, there was a whole set of other problems that I was dealing with in that oh, world. Man. Cause I was going to college. So I was a freshman at the University of Cincinnati. And so by the time I got to the office, it was two o'clock in the afternoon and my trucks and crews have been going out all morning. So I had to have somebody in operations running the shop until I got there. I did the sales at night. And you know, at the end of the day, this is why after a couple of years trying to do both, I had to decide, do I wanna be a graduate of college or do I wanna be an entrepreneur? And I, you know, unfortunately to my mother's, uh, 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 you know, uh, chagrin, I guess she, I did, she wanted me to be a doctor or a lawyer Yeah. and I, I ended up quitting school and, and running the business. So. I, I can kind of see that you're coming home for Thanksgiving and, uh, she's asking you when you're going to go back to school and you're like, well, you know, I could be a, a lawyer and make 2% of the income that I just made in this other business. But what would you tell your friends? What do you tell your friends are so uh, disappointed? Well, I had two older sisters, one married a doctor, one married a lawyer. So we got that covered in the family now. Yeah. So I, I could be the entrepreneur. So. Yeah. Let me know who, which lawyer to call when your heater doesn't work in the middle of winter. Tell exactly. me, tell me what the lawyer is going to do about yeah. that. How did you know that th being an entrepreneur was for you originally? Because sure, having money at 15 is great. But do you have a story about when you finally realize, like, look, this is what I'm going to do. Sure, I'll go to college because my parents want me to. But this is, I know I want to do this. When did you finally know that that was for you? Well, I think it, it, I was a, well, when I went to college, um, I would, you know, University of Cincinnati. I'll, I'll never forget a class that I went to. There was 800 students in the class. It was orientation. 800. 800. Orientation to business, right? And it was like the big class that everybody had to take that was, you know, uh, starting in, in, in college. And um, the, the, it was the first or second day that I went to this class. I'm trying to remember for sure, but the teacher didn't show up and there was a video playing. 
And he's like, sorry, I couldn't be here today, but take some great notes and I'll see you, you know, next time. And I'm like, you know, I, I, I'm running a business. I got 25 employees. I'm doing a million dollars in business. I'm here at school. The teacher can't even be here. Right. Why am I here? Okay. Right. So, you know, I quickly realized that I wasn't really getting anything out of school that was going to teach me anything in, in, in my life mode kind of thing. Right. I went to a, a, the business courses. I went to sales courses and the, the sales, the guy that's teaching the sales course was really a teacher. He really had never been a salesman. Right. So, you know, and I was doing sales. I was in the home knocking on doors, doing telemarketing and, you know, having great success uh, along the way. So it was sort of during those that, that first couple years of college. And, 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 and I'll say this, University of Cincinnati, not to put it down too much, but it wasn't a great, great college for me. I mean, um, I had graduated in a kind of an advanced program in high school with about 10 kids. In, in, in our senior year, um, we had a class of 200, but we had this advanced class of, of 10 that we got college credit for a lot of our, uh, of our courses. And so um, I went from that of 10 kids to 800. Yeah, that's and I'm insane. like, you know what? I'm not learning anything here. I was yeah. very challenged during high school, but I, I wasn't being challenged and I love the challenge. So um, and now my son, uh, he went to Penn State. He was very challenged. He had a great education. He loved it. And he graduated and, 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 and came out uh, with, you know, with a great uh, college degree. And I'm glad he did have his, his college education. But for me, um, you know, I, I grew up in a family my father wanted me to be an entrepreneur, so I had kind of his. Oh, he did. He, yeah, he he pushed me to be an entrepreneur while my mother was pushing me the other way. Huh. So there was a little bit of that infighting in the in you know at the kitchen table yeah. at times, you know. But um, I, I just knew that I was destined because I, I loved, I loved. First of all, I loved the thrill and the excitement of seeing the business grow geometrically. I mean, we were selling one a week, then five a week, then 10 a week. And I mean, I was like one of the top dealers in the city in, in my second year of business. And this is in an industry that had people that had been doing this for 40 years. Right. I was going to say everybody else is 55 and you're like 17 or yeah, 19 years old. I mean, they, they wouldn't actually give me a, a, a license to sell the furnaces. And uh, I sure. went to Carrier um, and uh, Carrier said, look, you're a kid, you don't have experience, you, you know, you've never operated your own business. Right. These things are heavy, you're gonna hurt yourself. Yeah. yeah. You have to you have to buy through another company. So I actually had to buy all my inventory from one of my competitors. And he put Man. a 10% markup of on course. it. And that was okay because I learned a few things from him along the way too. But you know, after I exceeded his total sales, uh, which happened in the first year, because uh, this guy was a good guy, but a small, you know, guy had been in the business. He was he was the worker kind of guy that just, you know, like he wasn't selling air conditioning systems in the winter. I was because we were out in homes doing furnace deals and slapping, you know, discounted air conditioning systems on those on the on the air conditioning on, on the furnaces when we installed them. So they, they they were like, how do you sell five air conditioning systems a week in the middle of the winter? Right. You know? in, in Ohio. In for Ohio. Those of you right? on the coast so who don't realize they, how I mean, cold it is. One day I had a visit from some of the top executives of Carrier coming over to, you know, is is this guy laundering money or what's he right. doing? Right. Is this guy a drug dealer? <laughs> you know? there's, he's got so, a basement full of air conditioning yeah, units. Yeah. So it was, uh, I, I knew we were on to something and, and I loved it. And I just, it, it, you know, school wasn't, I wasn't getting anything out of my college education because I really had a much better, better education in high school. And so, um, you know, actually the, the year that I, I dropped out, um, as a, as a junior, but I had a 3.85 out of four, um, uh, right. G, G, grade point average. And, um, so it wasn't lack of getting good grades or whatever. It was just time to move on. Yeah. Cause you don't hear that a lot. You don't hear, well, I did well in school and I decided to run business. You often hear, well, I was terrible in school. Turns out I wasn't cut out for that. I was cut out to be my own boss and stuff like that. And I think that's lost on a lot of young entrepreneurs. They think, well, I hate school or I hate my job, so I should do my own business. And I, I don't really agree with that. I think if you can excel in one area, you can carry that over. But yeah. if you're failing in another area, it doesn't necessarily mean that that's because you're not cut out to do that. It might be, be it, the cold truth might be you're not actually applying yourself. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Totally agree. Knocking on doors is a lot of hustle. 
did that come to you naturally? Because I, I think a lot of people are afraid to knock on doors, be rejected all the time by different people, and continue at it. In you the know, face of that. it. It. I'll say, I. I, I had a. Um, you know, I've worked at my father's restaurant. I also. I did a little newspaper sales down on the street corner. Um, you know, for a couple of years too, where I was selling ten cent newspapers and getting three cents uh, out of the ten cents commission, right? And so I learned early on. My father was one of those kind of restaurateurs that knew, he knew his customers, right? People came because they liked my father, Charlie, right? He was their friend. He would hang out with them. He would talk to them. You know, building a business in the bar business and the restaurant business, it's a neighborhood kind of thing. People like to go where they're wanted and they're liked and they, they know they're going to get good service, good food and a, you know, a, a free drink every now and then. <laughs> so my father would teach me some of those tricks and course introduced me to the to friends and and so I, I I think I was able at a young age to get rid of the fear factor because you know I, I will say this when I first started knocking on doors I got pretty much a lot of smiles and thank yous but kind of like the door slammed pretty quickly and I'll, I'll never forget one neighborhood I went into um, it was a beautiful neighborhood because it was just it was a new neighborhood that had been built about five years ago previous, all the driveways needed my service, but not one of the people said yes. So I literally got 20 mm. plus turndowns of thank yeah. you, but no thanks. That'd be the and, end for most people. Yeah. And, and, and I just kept going and going and going. And finally I thought, you know what, I just got to get one done in this neighborhood. So I, I finally talked to somebody. I said, look, I'm going to do your, your driveway for just the cost of the materials. I, I charge a hundred bucks, but I'm going to do yours for $15. You know, I just got to get a job done. Right? right. And so, so I got one done put a big, beautiful sign across it with string on the posts and took a, a before and after picture, went back to the same 20 some people that's told me no thanks. And I got about 18 of them then. So, um, wow. so that was the turning point for me as a salesperson is this is, you mentioned, oh, you learned how to, you know, the before, this and, before after. and after yeah. magical transformation, right? Well, that was what I was doing when I was 15 years old, knocking on doors. So I think the, the concept here is once you learn how to sell, uh, you know, and, and I, it was sort of self-taught. And then I started, I actually did start buying books and, and, you know, the Dale Carnegie's and, um, you know, Think and Grow Rich, Napoleon yeah. Hill. And then I started buying Zig Ziglar's materials. Yeah, yeah, and, sure. you know, Zig was, you know, he had motivational stuff and then closing techniques. And, you know, so then I really started tuning into, well, okay, I figured out a few of these techniques, but, you know, Maybe there's some people that can teach me more. Sure. So there was someone named Jay Douglas Edwards. There was Tom Hopkins. That's who I learned from, Tommy Hopkins. Tommy Hopkins. And I'm right? listening yeah. to this t cassette tape, and he's going, my my friend Shirley, she's in the typewriter business. And I'm thinking, I'm learning how to sell typewriters right now. I've never, I, the last time I even saw one of those things was in 83. Yeah, it's crazy. But that, So I then became a sponge for uh, self-improvement. And I started going to programs and and. You know, I, I bought a lot of it back in the day, Nightingale Conan, I remember. Oh, yeah. Had a lot of the, you know, success tapes and 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 all of that kind of stuff. And um, and so I, I just really enjoyed um, getting wisdom from other people that were a lot smarter than me in, in all these ways. And so when I when I really learned the art of closing the sale, then I could take a 50 percent close to an 80 percent close. And that was when I was honing my art. And then I could also teach that to other people. So, you know, I, I, when I my the, the last year that I owned the heating and air company and I decided to sell it because it was very labor intensive. And, you know, that that story about the guy with the bottle of whiskey by, by his side, yeah. that, that was a daily situation. I had to deal with some element of, you know, of that type of market putting out right? fires constantly. you know what I mean yeah. yeah and and shoddy work and things like that and so um you know I did sell the company but um the last year that I was in business I had three full-time salespeople that made a fantastic living selling and I was giving them the leads and so I now was running the business I was more of a you know of a real entrepreneur instead of a salesman just making some money did you ever miss the day-to-day -day of that business or were you just glad to be rid of it in some way? I, I, I honestly never missed that business at all <laughs> because, sure. you know, this was the problem. 
I was great at selling, and so was our team. And we'd sell it, we'd install it, but then we had to service it yeah. for the rest of our lives. Yeah. And so, oh, you know, I'm not getting enough cooling in this back bedroom. Well, they never had enough air in that back bedroom. We only put a, a, a system in there, you know, right. so now we had to fix all their problems, right? And, right? and then the thermostat wasn't working right and the humidifier, this and that. So, I mean, the service side, they, these customers owned me. And believe me, when it got cold and they didn't have enough heat, you know, we would get hundreds of phone calls sometimes, you know, from people that needed service right now. Right. And I, they all had a screaming yeah. baby, you know, that was six months old. Okay? Sure, so, sure. You know, so, uh, you know, at the end of the day, a service business like that, you got to be cut out for it. And um, I was an entrepreneur and, you know, I, I had my success with the business, made the money that I thought was great, but I wasn't enjoying coming into the office every day anymore. And I said, it's time to move on, find something else. What did you bring from school? Because I know you were a multi-sport athlete. You did really well. You were in that honors program or whatever that was. Yep. What did you bring from from school into your businesses? Because I'll never forget, wrestlers especially. I don't know what it is about yep. wrestlers. They are just, they love to be, they punish themselves all the time. Yep. I'll never forget Ralph Franco, mediocre student, yep. friend of mine, jumping rope in the shower with a sweatsuit and garbage yeah. bags on oh, while yeah. it's steam because yeah. he wanted to make weight. Yes. And if that kid took an ounce of that yeah. and brought it into his career, he's a millionaire right now. Yeah. Well, so I don't know if you know that I wrestled, but yeah. you know, I was I wrestled for four years. Uh, my freshman year, 98 pounds, varsity. Yeah. I uh, made the varsity uh, team, which which was, was unbelievable. And, and I wrestled, you know, 98, 105, 112, 119 over the years. And um, that was that gave me such a, a dedication and a camaraderie with the other wrestlers, as well as a you know a, a, a mindset that I think I applied in my entrepreneurial endeavors. Because th you know being an entrepreneur, the one thing you have to totally understand is you know you will get you will get shut down, you will get pushed off the ledge you 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 know you there will be many times when you're going to think you're going out of business and you can't take it you don't know what to do and you you need that perseverance and you need to be able to get up dust yourself off and go back at it and and so in in the world of wrestling when you know 3 hours of working out every day um you know was was a feat that uh that over the over time gave me the you know I think the mindset to, to become a, a, a pretty powerful entrepreneur. Yeah, I can see that. I can see especially from wrestling. Just there's something about wrestling that is just brutal, and it's it's so personal too. And you can't you kind of can't BS yourself because it, it's a team sport, but you're the one on the mat at that time. So in football, you can say, well, you know, I didn't get enough blockage or the the pass wasn't what it was supposed to be. But if you're the one who got their butt thrown down and pinned, it's like you can't look at the coach and go, that guy over there on the bench, man, yeah. gave me the stink eye and it ruined the match. It, exactly. It, it's a it's a one-on-one, -on -one, and those three two-minute matches seem to last a lifetime. Sure. Too, you know? Yeah. So, so what led to the birth of the infomercial then after that? Because you've got the before and after. That's germinating in the back of your head somewhere. How did we get from HVAC to the ab crunchers with Tony Littles in his ponytail that's great. hats? Well, thank you. So so I sold the business, uh, the heating and air business, had some cash. And um, I actually started, I said, okay, now my business is to go find the business I want to be in. And I was looking all over the country and reading all these ads, going to franchise shows, um, business opportunity classifieds. And literally, I, six months later, I had this tremendous education on all the business opportunities that were out there, but I didn't want to own a, you know, a, a, a Subway uh, a sandwich franchise, right? right? You know, be behind the counter all day long. Sure. I wanted to be Freddie DeLuca, the owner of Subway, right? So, um, so what I ended up doing was I said, you know, until I find what I want, I'm going to broker businesses because I had looked at literally hundreds of business opportunities, and and so I said I. I've kind of educated myself quite a bit here, much more than some of these average people that decide to go buy a business. I mean, as a business broker, and I, I got a real estate license and I was selling the real estate along with the business. So we'd sell restaurants, delicatessens, car washes, laundromats, flower shops. And I got an, I called it my curiosity overload days because I got a chance to see the inner workings yeah. of hundreds of companies, their cash flows, their rents, the employee costs, the food costs, I became very educated, and so I was selling businesses and then providing services to people because I actually call, called my company the Small Business Center because we said 
I put an accountant and an insurance guy and an advertising guy in the same floor, and we said, okay, we'll sell you the business. We'll do your books and records. We'll do your your logos. And, and of course, there were no websites back then right. because this was back in 1980. Flyers. But your flyers, okay, yeah, your, your jingles for the radio, yeah. right? And so the Small Business Center was this transition for me that kind of put me in, in, in as an entrepreneur's entrepreneur. And so one day, I, I'm sitting there, I was successful, I had you know 15 employees and I'm selling businesses and right downtown Cincinnati, having a lot of fun. And I bought a house and I ordered cable TV and cable TV came along and I'm, I yeah. ordered the 30 uh, cable, the 30 channel package. Which was which, you know, 30, 28 more channels than you normally got. Exactly, yeah. I mean back then I had ABC, CBS, NBC, you know, and, and one, you know, uh, kind of PBS thing, right. you know, but now I'm watching 24 hours of CNN, which I mean of, 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 of news and HBO, 24 hours of movies and, and 24 hours of sports on ESPN. Now you gotta remember, 19, this is early 80s, when, when you're getting 24 hours of sports, this is amazing. I mean, right. today, sure. you take it all for granted. But, you know, I went from seeing no sports to being able to watch everything, right? right. And I got to the Discovery Channel, and there was there was bars on the screen. And so I called the cable company. The color they, bars. The color bars, yeah. Yeah, and I, yeah color bars. And I, so I called the cable company, and I said, hey, I just got this cable package. I'm excited about the 30 channels, but, you know, something's not working on Channel 30. There's nothing there. And they said, what do you mean? I said, well, there's bars, cable, these color bars, right? So um, they said, oh, well, that's Discovery Channel. It's only an 18 hour a day network mm -hmm. and six hours a day. They, they don't have enough programming. It's a startup channel. We put those color bars up so you know there's not supposed to be anything, oh, right? Wow. So um, I said, well, why don't you put, we'll resume programming at a certain time, you know? But, you know, they didn't. So then the light bulb went off. Well, wait a minute. If, you know, what can I put on that, yeah, that downtime? For so next to nothing. This is 1984. And so I went out to the cable company. It was, it was Warner Cable. And I said, you know, I want to put something up. And so ultimately, I said, let me start putting products on that time. So we started putting kitchen products. And then we put fitness products. And then I met Tony Little. And I met Jack LaLanne and George Foreman. And all of a sudden, we're, we're, I then went to Discovery. We started just locally in Cincinnati on Discovery Channel in just Cincinnati. We were in 150,000 homes. Then I went to Discovery nationwide, cut a deal to buy the six hour block permanently for, for a two year contract. Wow. So, so I now owned six hours a day, 365 days a year for two years. Do you remember at all how much that cost per hour yes, at that point? It was $1,000 a day. For the for the contract for six hours for six for yeah a thousand dollars a day for six hours nationwide nationwide unbelievable deal because they had no idea right what it was worth they were like get his money up front because this moron yeah. is going to go out of business I mean, we gave like, him I we... think a month up front <laughs> yeah. you know wow and and so I mean and by the way a month up front here's thirty thousand dollars yeah that hey that's found money yeah well the third year we were generating tens of millions of dollars off of a three hundred thousand uh, dollars investment oh, and it was and because when the when that two-year contract came up somebody came along and paid 28 million bucks for what i was paying 365,000 for because they had they, 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 went, they knew this what guy was, must be making money he they knew they, they knew what it, it, it kind of grew what sales were because we would deal with vendors mm. that they would see how many pieces we were selling in a month right. and they were tracking how many times we were running so they knew what we were selling they knew what it was worth and at the end of the day, this is when it started getting competitive. Now, mm -hmm. this is now towards the later '80s um, when competitors came into the into the market. But for the first number of years, we did the food saver and kitchen products, and 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 we had amazing success. There was really very few people doing this. Yeah. Um, there was some real estate guys doing how to make money in real estate, you know, with no money down, kind of right. like you still see today, you know, but... Um, Who's, there was like a Tommy Vu or whatever. There was Tommy <laughs> Vu, there was Ed yeah. Beckley, there was Tony Hoffman, there was Dave Del Dotto, if you remember <laughs> Dave, with the, the, the waves crashing behind him in Hawaii. And um, yeah, so, <laughs> so that was the birth of the industry. And then really where it took off, so I had a, you know, I had about an eighty-five million dollar a year business in the U.S. Wow. And I said, what, you know, I had this library of shows, and I said, 
you know, what industry mirrors mine to give me some education on where I can go with this? Mm -hmm. And I said, well, the movie industry. And what do they do with movies? They take them international. Right. They go to the Cannes Film Festival and they sell the movies into foreign distribution. So a lot of companies say they made all their money in foreign distribution. So I took a little booth out at the, at the Cannes Film Festival and all of a sudden I got all these TV stations from all over the world coming to me wanting to run my Tony Little ab isolator sure. and cruncher and, and all that kind of stuff. And because all I had to do was, if it was England, we ran it in the same language. If it was in the Philippines, they ran it in English. But if it's in Japan, they dubbed it in Japanese. Yeah. Germany, they dubbed it in German. Oh, I've so seen them in Germany. We took the yeah. same asset and just dubbed it for a thousand bucks in the local market. And, and boom, all of a sudden, we launched in Japan. We did 80 million our first year in Japan. Wow. So we built that company to 500 million a year in sales. And it was an amazing growth. And this was back now all through the 90s. And, um, and, and, and then we ended up buying SCNTV.com and got into the internet side. And um, so we, had, we owned SCNTV Inc., SCNTV.com. And we were, you know, at the time, probably at, at one point, the biggest player in the business. Then Guthy Renker came along and those guys were brilliant marketers, Greg Renker and Bill Guthy. Mm -hmm. Of course, they do all of the beauty stuff. So skincare and proactive and Stephanie Seymour and um, um, uh, uh, Cindy Crawford. And the difference between what they do and what I was doing, when you sell an ab cruncher and people don't necessarily use it, they're not going to buy a second one. Okay. Right, so, right. you know what I mean? Now, well, may, or, or they might, but maybe not the same uh, but, item, but, right? but not the same item. Yeah. But with proactive, they put you on auto ship. So Greg Ranker yeah. was brilliant because continuity. he had the continuity angle. I was the gadget guy. And in hindsight, if I could do it all over again, you know, which I, I never argue about the path that I took because I'm happy where I ended up. But um, continuity has built a fabulous business for uh, the Guthy Ranker team because sure. they're, you know, they, they built billion dollar brands uh, out of uh, like a, a product like Proactive. So, you know, it's, but it, it, we had a, a fabulous run um, uh, until, you know, the most recent days uh, here. If you look at the last five years now, mm -hmm. there's been a shift in the marketplace. Uh, ESPN has lost 12 million subscribers. Yeah. Uh, you know, um, there's 50 plus million cord cutters out in the market that have cut the cord from pay TV. And so there's fewer people watching TV and the millennials are, you know, barely watching TV. And then you go yeah. to the younger, I have a 20 year old that doesn't even watch any television. So it's Netflix, it's his iPad, it's his, you know, his, his phone and Snapchat and can all that. Can you target people on those? I mean, you can pay to target those people. Yeah. So now what's happened is we've, we've shifted here in the last five years to, you know, more of a digital company. So, so, you know, yes, we still do look at the as seen in TV industry as mm -hmm. as um, as a place to to go after we do the digital though. So we used to test on TV. We now test on Facebook or sure. Instagram or Google or YouTube or something like that. So a test that used to cost you a couple hundred grand might cost you a few thousand or maybe thirty grand. A couple thousand, ten thousand, maybe twenty thousand tops. You know, where before you're right, we'd spend two hundred thousand to do a beautiful infomercial get the media test and find out it didn't work. And yeah. you know, now you can find out that there's crickets out there, meaning nobody's ordering um, for five grand. Okay. Right. So, you know, and by the way, if you spend 5,000 on Facebook and you don't get any orders, um, don't go spend another five and think it's going to change. Right. Okay? It's, so, it's dead. It's you know, done. It, you know, if there's something wrong, you got to change your offer or something. Right. So, um, it, it's kind of the same way on TV, but on TV, you had to go spend 200 grand to shoot the show. Is there anything that you look back on now and you laugh at? Like, how did I green light this? Like, I'm thinking Pet Rock, which was actually yeah. successful because that's why we know that. Right, right. So I, I say there was a turning point in my life on one particular project because we started getting caught up in this celebrity buzz. Of, yes. You know, oh, okay, Tony Little, George Foreman, you know, all these, you know, and, and, and of course, Guthy Rinker, Cindy Crawford, and all, any celebrity deal is going to be a hit. So one day, the chubby checker walked in my office and, oh, yeah. and he had this, product called the twist sizer and he's like you know the problem with fitness is 
people, they don't like to work out, but if they could listen to music and have fun while they're working out, you know, I've, I've created the solution. Right. It's the twist decisor. So, so we put $500,000 because it was an idea. We had to engineer right. it. We had to mold it, manufacture it, tool it, yeah. the whole thing, then produce this $285,000 infomercial oh, by the media. And when I tell you it bombed, I mean, I, I, I now joke and I say, if a guy named Chubby walks in your office with a fitness product, you should definitely walk and run the other way. Okay, <laughs> so you know, but we we spent five hundred on that one, and that was oh, the man. turning point that I said, no more, I can't do this anymore, because five hundred grand is a lot of money to be yeah. throwing around on a project, and and especially when you look at today's world, where you, you know we talk thousands, five thousand, ten thousand. How many projects at five thousand dollars a piece could I have done? on 500 grand's worth of loss. Oh yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So it's a much smarter market today. Just looking back and, and on that type of product, yeah, it must be kind of like, how did I miss that? But yeah, it shows that even people who really know what they're doing, who are really intelligent, who've been doing it for a long time, have a lot of experience, can still get caught up in that buzz. You see it now with things like uh, certain types of investments. You see really sophisticated parties getting caught up in hype and buzz, and it's uh, absolutely it, it can it can get anybody. When you first set foot on the the, the Shark Tank set, right? Yes. You're walking into the the set with Mark Burnett and all those yeah. folks. You've got, I, I don't know how much production of that cost, probably like a million plus dollars. Yes. And you've yeah. got uh, 150 or something people, 10 yeah. times what you've got working on oh, any yeah. commercial. Were you intimidated at all? Because you're used to filming in like a converted garage yeah. or something, right? Yeah, we're used to, you know, I'd shoot literally $2,000 shows back in the day, right? So, I yeah. mean, but we would shoot a $20,000 infomercial still. And yeah, i never forget, I walked into the set. It was at the, at the Sony movie lot where they had shot all the big old time movies, sure. you know, with, you know, uh, Greta Garbo and, and the, the, all the, you know, the big, in fact, they were shooting um, um, the um, Iron Man right next to us with Robert Downey Jr. Sure. And the, the ceilings were 50 plus foot high. The set was a million dollar set. The production was a million dollar production, the pilot. So they put $2 million into the pilot, 16 camera shoot. And I'm like, 16 cameras, why? Well, there's five sharks, they each had a camera on them, front and back, right. and then you had the, the people coming out, walking down the big you know, walkway, and you had the side angles, the overhead angles. It's easy to see how all of a sudden you got 16 cameras. Yeah. And by the way, you didn't see all, you know, you look you around, there's them. like yeah. four or five that you saw. So it was an unbelievable experience, but so Mark Burnett, I'll never forget, when he came over to, um, to talk to me before, and he talked to each shark. Now, a lot of people don't realize two of the sharks were dragons on Dragon's Den mm -hmm, in up English. in Canada. Actually, Canada. Oh, in Canada. Okay. Yeah. And see, O'Leary and Herchevik were on Dragon's Den in Canada, but uh, there was okay. an English version also. But they lived in Toronto. And so they had years of experience of doing the show, which was Mark's brilliant move, starting with two dragons already, right? That knew the format. Sure. So now Mark came over and he said, so Kevin, how you doing? I he said, I said, Hey Mark, I'm ready. I'm excited before we filmed second one. Right. And he said, Kevin, he said, look, he said, you've shot hundreds of infomercials. You're a pro. You get, you, you do this in your sleep. Now he says, so what are you thinking right now? I said, well, Mark, I said, 16 cameras. It's a, it is a little bit intimidating. Yeah. He says, this is what you got to do. When that person comes walking down, and they're going to pitch you. Imagine they're in your office and they're pitching you and just give them the exact attention and just the same set of questions that are going to come to your mind. You do this in your sleep. So don't worry about the cameras. We're getting the angles. We're handling the TV side. You're here to evaluate and ask the questions. Right, because you're and, used to directing the yeah, thing probably. And, and, and it just, right, he put me totally at ease with that. And this is one of Mark Burnett's brilliant um, I think um, one of his brilliant aspects is the ability to deal with talent, so to speak, right? Um, and so, um, you know, at the end of the day, I think, you know, I was very focused on these pitches and what, you know, I actually took it very serious because, the, you know, I was investing my own money, right? And yeah. so it's, you know, what I found out very shortly thereafter was Mark's interest was creating good television, sure. not necessarily good investments. Yeah, okay? he doesn't really care you know, about profit. So, after so he, I mean, he really, I mean, because he would come down after we'd shoot five, no deals were done, 
and we're all looking at each other like we just saw a bunch of garbage. Yeah. And he would say, Sharks, look, nobody invested anything in the last three hours, five hours. What's going on? We're not, you know, we got to, if we want to get this, and this is before we had distribution, right? Sure, sure. It's like, I got to be able to tell the networks that we've got some action and some deals. Right. And Millions of dollars are yeah. flowing through the Sharks. And we're team. like, well, Mark, which one of those five would you have invested <laughs> yeah. in? Let's, let's be honest. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, but there was always, you know, right after that, we all wanted the next deal because sure. Mark gave us the little pep talk, right? But we definitely all invested in deals that we would never have wanted to invest in. I'll really? say that. Absolutely. And so, I mean, the 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 unfortunate side of, of, a, of a, you know, of a Shark Tank, I mean, I would tell my wife, hey, I'm going to shoot Shark Tank. And she's like, what and this is before it aired right? sure. you know, no one knew what it was they're like is that a is that on discovery channel some kind of fishing show or what is that you know I said no it's a business show and i'm a, a business shark she's like well how does it work i said well you know i may invest a million bucks half a million you know whatever well when will we get that back well, maybe never. never. She's like, well, wait a minute. Let me understand this. Okay, <laughs> why are you on this show? Right. right. You know. Now, when Vanna White's on, you know, the Wheel of Fortune, she gets paid to turn the letters. Right. We're paying to be on the show. Right. So it was a little bit different scenario, and it also I consider myself as one of you know the original sharks, the you know to have paved the way to get the show to distribution sure. and and doing some of those early deals that got excitement and. You know, I invested in a cat toilet training system. Yeah, I um, remember that. That one. did millions of dollars in sales. But but guess what? You know, that would not have been something if they had walked into my office and said, "Would you invest in this?" That I would have even considered. But I'm a shark in Shark Tank. I'm going to invest in it. But now I'm going to make it successful. So I now had to spend the time to go you know, punch it up, get to publicity and do the road show and take her to the Chicago houseware show and go to Walgreens and get it on end caps. And, you know, and yeah, we built a multi-million dollar business out of that. And it was a, a great success for everybody. But it's, you know, I was putting a lot of time and effort into deals that ultimately weren't kind of my sweet spot. Sure. Yeah. And I can see that a lot of people who come in there, they even cast certain people where it's just a terrible idea. They've got the formula down now. Oh, Once yeah. every show, there's a, are you kidding you, me? You got kind one of real idea. like crazy situation that, that you know that nobody would go. Right, yeah, yeah you've <laughs> got, yeah, the, uh, the, these are light up badges that get sewn on your jeans that look like they were straight out of 1989. And <laughs> even the people pitching them are like, I right. don't, would never wear this, you know. Crazy stuff. Do you have advice for people who might be pitching to any investor? I mean, you've seen a lot of good and you've seen a lot of terrible, terrible pitches. Yes. What, do you, what do you see that works and what doesn't? Well, okay, a couple, a couple things. And, I, and I, I love giving Sharon some, some, some good details with the listeners here today because I've taken over 50,000 pitches over the last 30 years. And it's only 1,500 or 2,000 a year type of thing. So mm -hmm. it's in, 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 you know, and it's, it's been more in the last, you know, 10 years than it was in the first 20. Uh, so, um, you know, I have a system. I say you should, you, you have to, it's in a three-step fashion. You tease, you got to have some kind of a little tease. Mm -hmm. And that's to get the attention with some kind of a problem. Now, you, so if you're coming on, whether it's Shark Tank or any investor, you, you need to get their attention because you got to stand out from all the clutter, understanding that investors are looking at dozens of deals. So what, you know, get their attention with a problem, then please them with the solution to the problem in a unique fashion. And this is important. What is, you know, Mr. Wonderful will always, you know, Kevin O'Leary, right? Mm -hmm. what, is, what does he say? He'll say, well, does anything else exist in the marketplace that's similar to what you've got? Mm. And I, I would ask the same thing too. And so if there's something already identical that's already in Walmart, you know, I mean, might not be interested right in the deal. Enough. But yeah. if you're unique enough such that nothing else solves the problem in a similar fashion, then I might be very, very interested. And is there any IP or intellectual property around it? So, so you tease them, you please them, then you seize. And that's the third step. Seizing is you have to create an irresistible offer. So that's much like if you're selling a product on TV, you know, but wait, there's more. If you buy right. now, you're going to get these two or three I'm other still things. still not done. Right? Yeah. Okay, yeah. And you'll see 15 things up there for 10 bucks or something, right? So um, an irresistible offer with an investor has to be, you know, an irresistible payback, or maybe it's an accelerated payback, or it's 
um, the, for those to get in early, you're going to get double the equity or something that is gives them a, a buy now incentive. Mm. And the biggest mistake that people make that are pitching investors is they don't put themselves in the shoe of the investor and they're only focused on themselves, that they need money, but they, they have to understand the investor has to write the check. Right. So I, I, I'm on both sides because I pitch product to QVC and to Walmart and to all kinds of distribution partners that, hey, I've got a great product, I gotta pitch it, right? So I've gotta tease them, please them, and seize them. But um, at, at the same time, I'm an investor and I'm taking pitches, so I wanna know that the person pitching is thinking about me and what's, you know, what, what's gonna get me to write the check. And just one tip that I like to give on this note is a lot of times, one of the big risks of a Shark Tank style deal is think about owning 10% of a private company. You just put a hundred grand up or a million dollars and it's private. When do you get your money back? What's the exit strategy? Right. So I like to, when I pitch investors, I try to give them an accelerated payback on their investment so that if they put up the money and they're owning 10% of the company, maybe they get 100% of the profits mm. until they get all their money back and then they have a carried interest. So I'm taking care of your problem, Mr. Investor, that you know, maybe you're thinking, well, it's risky and how do I know I'll get my money back? Right, right? it's gonna what's, take me 20 years. What's Actually, the exit it'll strategy, take you three. right? Yeah. yeah, so I try to paint a great, get, get your money back quick kind of a storyline. So, right. so you, you mitigate know, the risk, exactly. handle the security problem that they have. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I think a lot of people, like you said, they don't look at what's in it for the investor as much. They say, you'll make a lot of money. Well, yeah, over 30 years, but they don't think about opportunity cost. I could take the money I'm investing in the cat toilet training product, make an infomercial with it, and for sure make money yeah. in a year. I mean, someone will come in, hey, I, I need a hundred grand, I'll pay you 5% on your money. Yeah. You know, and it's like, look, if I'm taking this risk, I need five times my investment, not 5%. Right. 5% is five grand. On a hundred grand, I need 500 grand, yeah. okay? Because I'm, you know, because three other deals I did didn't work. And, you know, so I need, you know, investors in, in, in these kinds of situations are looking, you know, I mean, I hate to say they're sharks and, you know, they, 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 they cut, you know, terrible deals or whatever, but they have other places to put their sure. money in. and look at some of the returns some of these deals have brought back. And if you look at the Ubers and the Facebooks of the world, there's been some pretty nice returns on investment sure. across the, the transom. A lot of those Shark Tank deals though, not so good. If you pitch elsewhere, those are some bad deals those people take sometimes. Sometimes, absolutely. Yeah. Over the years, you've launched 500 products, something, well, well over that now, yeah. I'm sure. Uh, you mentioned that the most powerful habit or system that you've had has been your network. And that's one thing we're really big on, on the Art of Charm at our live programs in LA is networking, creating relationships. How do you go about that? How do you recommend that your uh, team members, the people that you invest with, network and create relationships? Because it's hard yeah. for some people to put themselves out there. Sure, great question. So. First of all, I've always believed, um, I formed a couple of organizations over the, over the years. And when I was a young entrepreneur back in the mid eighties and I was doing all these beautiful infomercials, um, I was hanging out with some cool people, Michael Dell and Ted Leonsis, who ended up becoming number two at AOL um, and, and uh, Stuart Johnson and, and Vern Harnish. And we all started the Young Entrepreneurs Organization. We put a thousand dollars each into an account and we, and. YEO has now, as we got older, we changed it to EO, and now it's the Entrepreneurs Organization. Right. It's the largest organization in the world of its kind. Um, and we're in uh, 40 plus countries, 150 cities, with thousands of members all over the world. So that was a fabulous networking opportunity for me because sure. today, no matter what city I go to, uh, if I go to Shanghai, I can put out the word, hey, I'm in town, 20 people will show up for lunch. And now, hey, I need a phone center. I I need this, I need that, boom. That's networking at its finest. So I also, with Greg Ranker and a few others, started the Electronic Retailing Association in 1990. So EO started as YEO in 1987. We just had our 30th anniversary. And um, ERA started in 1990, and that's uh, the Electronic Retailing Association. Again, networking in 100 countries of people, fulfillment centers, phone centers, distribution partners, 
all around the world for my products. So, so I believe sometimes you just have to take the bull by the horn and do it yourself. Right. Create your own groups, your own organizations. But today, I love the LinkedIn's and the Facebooks and the Facebook Lives and creating content and all the kind of digital strategies that are available to entrepreneurs today. So I think that it's important that entrepreneurs, that you can't just sit, I mean, here I am, I've been an entrepreneur for more than 40 years, and you know, my son who's 29 years old is always pushing me, Dad, you gotta be creating more content. You know, <laughs> it's like, what do you mean, shooting videos? That's how this yeah, happened, right? Right, yeah, yeah. You, you gotta shoot more videos, do more podcasts, get out there, right? So, so certainly, there's, you know, guys like Gary V and the like that are, you know, I think he's got a guy following him around I'm all day sure. long. He's amazing, yeah. right? You know, and so I haven't gone to that extent and it's, you know, I don't like, think you should. at some point yeah. it's, it, it, it's, it, it would drive me crazy probably, but, um, you know, God bless and he's built an amazing business and, and his success is, is, is second to none. But, um, you know, I, I, I just... I do a lot of trade shows. I, I, you know, I go to dozens of trade shows a year. The consumer electronic show, the hardware show, houseware, fitness shows, the beauty, the toy fair, the golf show. Sometimes I like to have a little fun, meet some, you know, PGA golfers and hang out because I like to hack it out on, sure. on the weekends sometimes there too. But, but I think an entrepreneur can never stop networking. And, um, you know, it's just, it's, it's so important to be able to get out there, press the flesh, and I have a system that I use and it, you know, I go to trade shows, I, I hit the media rooms and, and talk to the media. I go to the new product showcases um, and I network with people that I've been doing business with for years. And, and I find, you know, any show I go to, I'm going to come out of there with some new business. That makes sense. I think a lot of people who run and start businesses think I got to keep my head down. I've only been doing this for a few years. I've got to focus on my prototype, my sales guys, my product, my whatever. Networking is one of those. I'll do that as soon as I, and then fill in the blank. And a lot of times it's an excuse right. to, well, I'm an introvert, so I got a medical excuse to not network, and it just doesn't work. It'll right. hurt you long term. Exactly. No, yeah. you, you got to have a system. It, it's got to be part of your business and marketing plan. Yeah. And if you're an introvert and you think you can't do it, what do you recommend for those people? Well, I mean, look, I, I'll be honest with you. I think, you know, I've used coaches in my life um, across various spectrums. I've had, um, you know, operational coaches, uh, speaking coaches, um, marketing coaches. I've spent hundreds of thousands of dollars over the years in paying experts to give me good advice. And so if you're an introvert, um, get somebody to coach you on 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 how to you know can you know get out of that shell a little bit and get out there and continue to, to network because I mean I'll, I'll give you a good example I you know somebody said you know you got to go start speaking and 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 so it was kind of easy after coming off Shark Tank you know all oh, people didn't mind hearing from me but you can speak smart so I go to the Chamber of Commerce and I'd speak and then the Chamber of Commerce said you know Kevin we do an annual conference here in, in Tampa Florida where 27 chambers from the whole state come would you like to speak at that event uh -huh. and so now I'm speaking to 27 chambers and at the end hey if you'd like for me to come to your local chamber of course there's a fee involved right, right. Um, you know just leave some notes at the end here and I'll get back to you well I picked up five speaking gigs out of that one speech so you know there's smart ways to network and and you know I think if an introvert knew that they could go and speak to 27 chambers at one shot, um, you know, would you be interested? You know, these are the things that coaches might be able to help you with to make it smart so that you don't have to go spend a week in Las Vegas at the CES show, maybe get there for a day or two and hit the highlights. Right, so you end up saving more time, which of course any entrepreneur knows time is money, especially when you're talking about your business. And it can be fun, it can be effective. Instead of standing in the corner at a CES show for a week, you can, like you said, press the flesh in an effective way for two days, and then it's over quicker, if that makes you feel better. <laughs> yeah. Work smarter. Exactly. Kevin, yeah. thank you so much. I know you gotta run, you gotta Doing cut the LA traffic. Great to be here, LA, crazy uh, week this week, but yeah. fantastic uh, sharing some time with you. Great interviews, and thank you so much. Thank you.